هي أحسن كل شيء خلقه وبدأ خلق الإنسان من طين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبد الله ورسوله أرسله ربه رحمة للعالمين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار I bear witness that there is none worthy of our worship except Allah سبحانه وتعالى And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the seal of the prophets and the final messenger to all of humanity. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is none to misguide. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves to stray, there is none to guide aright. Today, inshallah, we will start with a new topic, which is about the Quran. A lot of people listen to the Quran in the prayers, or in the prayers, or in the prayers, or in the prayers, or in the prayers. ولكن لا يشعر بهذا الإحساس تجاه القرآن لا يتأثر بالقرآن لا يجد ارتباط روحي ومعنوي بالقرآن فخطبة اليوم تركز على هذا الموضوع إن شاء الله So I'm going to begin بإذن الله تعالى by referring to a couple of uh, stories related to the Quran The first story is about a man whose name is Gary Miller Dr. Gary Miller. I'm not sure if you heard the name before, but back in the 1970s, in 1977, he debated Ahmad Didat. So Gary Miller uh, was basically, or still is, he uh, from uh, Canada, Ontario, and back in the 1970s, he used to teach mathematics at the University of Toronto. So he became famous after his debate with Ahmad Didat, and he challenged the authenticity of the Quran, and he started to study the Quran very closely, and by 1978, he accepted Islam. He was a preacher, uh, very well versed in the Bible, and he was a debater, a mathematician, and so on and so forth. And the man, the, the good thing about this man, he, when he approached something, he was very fair-minded, and he was very objective. So when he studied the Quran for about a year, he became a Muslim, alhamdulillah, and he started to do da'wah. And there is a very important lecture by him, you can go to uh, YouTube, it says the amazing Quran. And the lecture was later transcribed into a small booklet, you can read the booklet, it will give you some insight about the beauty and the power of the Quran. It's an amazing book, the amazing Quran. I meet some Muslims, and they tell me when they first heard the Quran, even before they became Muslim, they come to the masjid for observation or they listen to an audio about the Quran. And subhanAllah, automatically tears will come down. They don't understand a word, but the recitation moves them and they start to cry. And so on and so forth. The stories are so many. Even subhanAllah, some people who never accepted Islam, they were moved by the Quran. We read in the books of Tafsir, when this ayah was revealed and the Prophet ﷺ recited the ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي They say that when Abu Jahl heard the ayah, قَالْ وَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَيَأْمُرُ بِمَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَقِ He says, this Qur'an is inviting people to good manners. So even Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, they were impressed. And they would go at night, we know this from Sira, they will make a promise to each other, we will never listen to the Qur'an. But in the dark, when the Prophet ﷺ would recite by the Kaaba or in his Salah, they would come and they would listen secretly to his Qur'an. And then when they pump on each other in the dark, okay, what are you doing here? I thought we made a deal that we would not listen to the Qur'an. They say, oh, I was, I was heading to my mom or I, I was going to the store. They make up stories. But the, the Qur'an moved them and it touched their hearts. So now the question is, if the Qur'an touched the heart of Gary Miller and those who accept Islam all the time, even by just reading the translation, people become Muslim. And I've seen this all the time. People read the translation in English or French or any other language. And of course, this is like less than 1% of what the Arabic says. It doesn't reflect the beauty and the power of the Arabic, but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala touches hearts through translation. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in mysterious ways. And if the Quran moved someone like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab to say beautiful things about the Quran, how come that these days some of us they don't feel the connection with the Quran? Like you listen to the Quran in Tarawih, the Shaykh is reciting in the front, and some people are crying. Some of them are not Arabs, they don't know what is going on. And you, you hear them crying in the Salah, and you feel like, why are they crying? What's wrong with these people? The question is, what's wrong with you? Especially if you understand the Arabic, why it doesn't touch your heart? Why it doesn't move you? And people always come with questions like, I don't feel the connection with the Quran. Yes, I understand the meaning, but it doesn't move me. And, and people say, well, my, my children ask questions and I can't answer. Like they ask, why does Allah say this? And the other day, last week, I, I got a you know, you know, question from a brother. And he said that his son, he goes to high school and his friends ask questions about the Quran. And I said, what are these questions? And he said, my son is asking this and this and this. And I told him, your son would never come up with questions like these. These questions that are uh, commonly asked by missionaries and they try to put doubt and attack the Quran. Your son would never ask something like this and he would never know that something like this exists in the Quran. He doesn't read the Quran. How come that he comes up with all these questions? Someone is trying to put doubt in his mind because he doesn't have the knowledge of the Quran and you cannot answer it because you don't know either, right? Some people will say, well, uh, you know, the Quran is good, we use it for barakah, I put it in my car in the, you know, in the front, in the dashboard, or in, in the back, just for protection, especially back home if you don't have insurance, this is what most people do, for barakah. They recite it when someone dies, um, and so on and so forth. But this is all what the Quran is all about, for most people. So they think it is outdated. Why would I have to read about Fir'aun who died like three, four thousand years ago? Why do I have to read about Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab? Why do I have to read all these things? What, what kind of benefit do I get? So they feel like the Quran is not relevant to them. It talks about people who lived and died thousands of years ago. What does it have to do with me? It is not relevant to my life. It doesn't deal with all the challenges that I go through every day. I'm suffering. I'm trying to buy a house in Mississauga and the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the real estate market is going up and what does the Quran have to do with this? Uh, corrupt politicians back home, social problems and so on and so forth. What does the Quran have to contribute to my life? So sometimes I get these questions. So the key to solving this problem is the word tadabbur. Reflecting on the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us in the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran? Why in the world do you not reflect, read and reflect the Quran? Some of us or many of us actually have taken upon themselves to memorize the Quran. I see and I've seen schools and health programs, which is a fantastic thing. People go, they spend two, three years, day and night, they memorize the Quran, they become hafiz, they read salah, alhamdulillah. For them, memorizing the Qur'an is the end. But in Islam, memorizing the Qur'an, which is an amazing thing, and I encourage everyone to teach them, you know, their kids to memorize Qur'an. It's an amazing thing, it's a beautiful thing. It's one of our Jewish ijaz because I don't know of any other faith community that can memorize their scripture. The Qur'an is the only book that is memorized by millions of people. But again, this is just the means, it is not the end. So, memorizing is good, but there is another level of relationships with the Qur'an, tadabbur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Qur'an, there are two things, hawf, preservation, and tadabbur, reflection and applying the Qur'an. He said, hawf is my duty, I will take care of the hawf, hawf. You don't have to worry about protecting or preserving the Qur'an by committing it to memory. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, I'm not telling people don't memorize the Qur'an. I'm asking everyone to memorize whatever they can of the Qur'an. The whole thing or some of it, alhamdulillah. Preserving the Qur'an is the duty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafudun. Allah says it in the Qur'an. I'm the one who revealed the Qur'an and I'm, I'm the one who's preserving it. Don't worry about it. Your job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kitabun 
أنزلناه إليك مبارك في سورة صاد كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليتدبروا آياته We have revealed this blessed book to you so you can reflect on the meaning Most of us say no we will take care of the حف يا الله you take care of the تدبر right we will preserve it and you do the tadabbur. We do it, you know, the other way around. So what happens when you do tadabbur in the Quran? When you read the Quran and memorize it and reflect on it and apply it to your life. So what do you get from that? Number one, we realize by reading the Quran that the Quran is relevant to your life. And you develop this personal relationship with the Quran. It talks about you and it talks to you. Before this connection with the Quran, when you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying in the Quran that riba is haram, do this, don't do this, you feel like, Bikalim ibn Khaltak Masih, he's not talking to me, he's talking to my cousin. But when you do tadabbur and you reflect on the Quran, it actually talks to you. If it says riba haram, he's talking to you. If it says eat from halal, he's talking to you. So you apply it to yourself and you know that it is relevant. Okay, what about the stories in the Quran that are repeated all the time? The story of Musa and the story of Yusuf and all these prophets and figures in the Quran? I'm going to digress a little bit. Uh, last year I was, uh, you know, giving a ma'ibah to the students of the Main Gate Islamic Academy. And I said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a hadith in Ibn Hibban, the Prophet sallallahu says, from the beginning till the end, till the time of Muhammad sallallahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent 124,000 prophets from Adam to Muhammad Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala over thousands and thousands of years. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala sent 124,000 prophets. Not every one of them had a scripture like the Quran, Zabur. Few of them had books, but the majority of them were Anbiya to just deliver the message, like Harun and and Sulaiman and so on and so forth. Alayhi Musalam. So the question came from one of the students. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000, how come that he only tells us about 25 of them by name in the Quran? What about the other, like, thousands? Why Allah didn't mention them, right? And Allah says it in the Quran, مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكُمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I told the student that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us samples from the lives of these prophets so we can live a good life. So for example, one prophet had to deal with political problems or political corruption in the case of Musa and Fir'aun. One prophet had to deal with the challenges facing the youth, like Yusuf alayhi uh, challenges with the other gender, challenges with uh, uh, siblings, rivalry, and, and so on and so forth. One prophet had to deal with financial issues and financial corruption, Shu'aib alayhi His people were chore, thieves called him Tug in Somali. So every prophet had to deal with a totally different issue. So collectively, they give us a standard to live by. So this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about political life and how to live, uh, you know, a political, politically acceptable life, he would give one sample. When he talks about financial issues, he would give one sample. When he talks about social life, he would give one sample. He didn't have to repeat all the stories. Because imagine if the Quran talks about 124,000 prophets, it will have more names than the yellow pages. But the Quran is the book of life. It talks, it gives you samples that you can live your life according to. So this is why when you read in the Quran, any issue that you face in life, you will find something relevant in the Quran. And it will hit you and it will touch you when you come across all these ayat. So the Quran is relevant to your life. Number two, you realize another aspect about the Quran, and Mu'ajizatul Khalidah, the eternal legacy and the eternal miracle of Muhammad Sallallahu We read in the Quran, اقتربت الساعة وانشق القمر. The, uh, the, the uh, moon was split as a Mu'ajizah for Muhammad Sallallahu And I challenge anyone here to prove to me that they saw the moon splitting. It happened 1500 years ago, none of us was there, we didn't see it. The Prophet ﷺ multiplied food by his barakah and multiplied water. We didn't see any of that. And there are so many other mu'ajizat. We didn't see them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the Quran as a proof till the end of time for the honesty and the prophethood of Muhammad ﷺ. Plus other prophets 
Isa alayhi salam giving life to the dead and giving cure to the blind and Musa alayhi salam his staff and his hand and we didn't see any of that. The only the Quran is a surviving mu'jizah till the end of time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using it as a proof to all nations that this is truly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mu'jizah al-Khalidah till the end of time. And to prove that this is mu'jizah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from Muhammad sallallahu who couldn't read, who couldn't write. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is challenging us in the Quran. If you don't believe that this Quran is from me, there are a couple of things you need to do. And this is, by the way, mentioned in the amazing Quran by Gary Miller. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging us in the Quran. If you don't believe that this Quran is from me, there are two things you need to do. Number one, produce another Quran. You can't. Even the people of Mecca, who were the masters of the Arabic language, they couldn't do it. Then the challenge was reduced. Produce ten surahs. And subhanAllah, in Surah 11 of the Qur'an, Surah Hud, فَاتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُورٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرِيَةٍ In Surah number 11, Allah says, produce 10 surahs, referring to the 10 before. And in Surah Baqarah, فَاتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, it refers to Surah Fatiha, produce one surah like the one before, Surah Fatiha. So this is amazing, and the challenge is still up. No one was able to meet the challenge. So this is one way. The other way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, if you don't think the Qur'an is from me, here find a mistake. In Surah Nisa, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِي اِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرٍ If this Qur'an was from anyone other than Allah, you would find a lot of contradictions inside. So people have tried, they come up with things, they just show their ignorance of the Arabic or their ignorance of Islam or their ignorance of the Qur'an. But there is not one realistic mistake that people can find in the Qur'an. And the challenge is still up there. Find a mistake in the Qur'an. Now, I know some of you are students, they go to college and they submit papers. When you write a good paper, no matter how perfect your paper is, you don't go to your professor and say, hey, you, uh, here is my paper, it's perfect, and I challenge you to find a mistake. He will fail you, of course. But no one does this. No other book, no other scripture, the Torah, the Injil, no other book, the Zabur, none of them ever made these challenges. Find a mistake. You can't. No one ever made this challenge. And to prove the eternal message of the Quran and the ajaz of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put some scientific references and some things that no one knew. At the time of Muhammad Sassan, like Ghulibatul Rum, Allah says in Surah Rum, Surah number 30, that the Romans have been, you know, vanquished. They were defeated badly at the hands of the Persians. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in three to nine years, the Romans will be victorious. And after eight years, the Romans defeated the Persians. Who knew that at that time? No one. Scientific references in the Quran, in Surah, for example, Surah Hajj 22 and Surah 23, Surah Mu'minun, it talks about the developmental phases of the baby inside the mother. And this became like knowledge in, in North America, in Europe, in the last 100, 150 years ago. Because they believed, yes, the father puts the seed and it develops and the mother has nothing to do with it. But in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِن نُطُفَةٍ أَمْشَاجٍ it's a mixture of the sperm and the egg. Both come together and they form the baby. Allah says it very clearly in the Quran. No one knew that at the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Big Bang in Surah Anbiya, Surah 21. Don't the believers see that the earth and the universe, they were one mass and I split them apart. It's mentioned very clearly in Surah Anbiya, Surah 21 of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the constant expansion of the universe. I built the heavens with might and I'm constantly expanding it. The heavens most of the time in the Quran means the universe at large. All these scientific references in the Quran and more, people come across them and they're touched. Because no way in the world Someone like Muhammad who lived in the desert 1500 years ago, 
with no knowledge available for him. He couldn't read, he couldn't write. No telescopes, no microscopes. How come that he could have come up with something like this? It's, it's unbelievable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us the proof that this Quran is from him. Now, in the last few minutes of the life of the khutbah, I hear things about the Quran all the time, especially from missionaries and some idiots like Robert Spencer and some others. And subhanAllah, the problem is they can't read the Arabic. And every time they, they attack the Quran, they don't attack the Arabic, they attack someone's translation. And I tell them, Ya Ammi, the translation is not the Quran, it is just a tafsir by someone. It is not the Quran, the Quran is totally different. This is in Arabic only. If you want to find a mistake in the Quran, show me in the Arabic. But they can't read Arabic, so they can't do it, right? The other thing is, Yes, there are some ayat in the Quran, they are so mu'jiz, so miraculous, that sometimes it's beyond our comprehension. And I'll give a couple of examples. And I can ask you kindly to move up a little bit. Uh, people are waiting outside. No one in the people of Mecca or the pagans of Arabia attack the Quran, they say, oh, it has a grammatical mistake, it has this mistake. It never happened. It never happened. This is a new thing. And the interesting thing is, it is coming from someone who doesn't even speak Arabic, right? So this is the amazing thing about the attacks on the Quran. There are some challenging ayat, some mu'ajiz ayat in the Quran, and the first people to discuss them and talk about them are not missionaries or evangelists or, you know, people who are Islamophobes. No, it was big scholars of Islam like al zamakhshari in his book Al-Kashaf, his tafsir. One of the most amazing linguistic tafsirs of the Quran, Al-Fakhr al-Razi. They say, if you ask me, فَإِنْ قُلْتَ لِمَاذَا قَالَ اللَّهِ كَذَا وَكَذَا قُلْتُ So they always ask in their tafsir, if, if you ask me, why does Allah say this? I tell you that. They explain it in a very logical way. So Muslims took care of that. There is no problem in this case. So people say, okay, what about these ayat in the Quran that we don't understand? They, Letters, for example, alif, lam, mim, tasim, mim, ham, what, what does that mean, right? So the ulama يعني, have a lot of theories to explain. And the, يعني, the, it always comes down to this is from the knowledge of Allah. We don't know. This is from the mu'ajiz of the Quran. And if you are able to produce some letters like these, put them together to form a surah or the beginning of a surah, do so. You can't. So this is part of the of the challenge of the Quran. Some of the ulama tried uh, to explain these uh, letters at the beginning of the Quran, the huruf muqattaat at the beginning. So some say, for example, and have checked it, and most of the time it's very accurate. They say, like for the map, there is a legend. These letters at the beginning, these are just like the legend of the map. It is like the mini or a small table of contents. Most of the time, and I've checked it with myself, most of the time these letters at the beginning refer to prophets mentioned in, the, in inside. Every single time you see Meem at the beginning, Alif, Lam, Meem, Ha, Meem, Ta, Seem, Meem, know for sure that Musa alayhi salam is mentioned inside. Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Surah uh, Maryam for example. Kaf refers to Zakaria, Zakaria, Ha, Harun, and so on and so forth. Ya to Yahya. So this is amazing, but we don't know for sure. The knowledge is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir of Ayah Alif Lam Mim of Surah Baqarah, he says, it's very amazing that when I took all these 14 letters that are repeated at the beginning of the surahs of the Quran, I tried to form a sentence, this sentence came up. Nasun hakim qati'u lahu sir. He says, when I put all these chopped up letters at the beginning of surahs Hamim, Tazi, I took Every letter that, that is repeated, I took it once. I formed the sentence, and the sentence that came up, a wise, decisive text full of wonders. This is the sentence that came in Arabic. Nasun hakimun qati'un lahu sir. So isn't that something? This is something amazing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another point, just because of the time, the Quran repeats stories all the time. Why is that so? Like Musa alayhi salam is mentioned all over the place, Ibrahim alayhi salam all over the place. Why is that happening? One thing, we know that the Quran was revealed to the Prophet in 23 years. 
And although the stories are repeated, there is no contradiction. This is amazing about the Quran, except especially to someone who couldn't read or write or record whatever was revealed to them. And number two, this is also amazing when you read the Quran, you see, yes, the story is repeated, but the focus is always different. The focus of the ayat that are repeated is always different. The story of Musa السلام, in Surah Kaf is about Musa al Khidr, which is not mentioned in any other surah. If you read the story, of course, of Musa السلام, in Surah Araf, the focus is the suffering of Bani Israel. If you read surah, uh, the story of Musa السلام, in Surah, for example, Al Qasas, the focus is the childhood of Musa السلام, when he killed an Egyptian by mistake, he ran to Medin, he got married. The focus is always different. The same for when it talks about Jannah Jahannam. The focus is always different. One, one time it talks about the quality of life. One time it talks about the food. One time it talks about the dress. And so on and so forth. So the focus is always different, but there is never a contradiction in the Quran. So when you think of these repeated stories in the Quran, think of a human being. When you look at a human being, no one ever came and said, okay, when I look at this brother, subhanAllah, he has two, ten fingers. And he has another ten in his feet. And he has two ears, two eyes. No one ever criticized your perfect form because some organs of the body or some elements in your body are repeated. But when they look at you, they see the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think of the Quran in the same way. When you look at the Quran, Surah Baqarah, Surah Al Imran, some of the stories are repeated, they are like the hands. The story of Musa alayhi salam, they are like the fingers. They complete each other, and so on and so forth. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 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 Another aspect that people use to discredit the Qur'an and put doubt about the Qur'an, and I'll mention this in, in just one minute, inshallah. And please, if, if you find space in front of you, move forward. Jazakallah khair. Al-Qira'at. So, when missionaries, for example, they debate, they always say, oh, you say, you know, Christians, we have different versions of the Bible. Yes, we know that the, um, you know, the, the Catholic Bible has seven extra chapters that the Protestant Bible doesn't have. And some other sects, they have books that have extra chapters like the Russian church and the Ethiopian church and the Egyptian Coptic church. They have more. The Egyptian one has about 81 chapters. And the Protestant one has 67. So 67. And the Coptic Egyptian one has 81 chapters. So there are hundreds of pages of differences. So we tell them the Quran has only one version. We're not talking about versions here. But the style of recitation is slightly different. And the meaning is always the same. They say, for example, in Egypt, in Turkey, in India, Pakistan, they have Qira'at Hafs. In Libya, they have Qanun. In Morocco, they have Warsh. In Somalia, they have a Duri and a Susi. The meaning is always the same. And this is one of the beauties of the Quran, that you read the pronunciation is slightly different, but the meaning is always the same. And the reason is, there were tribes in Arabia, they spoke different dialects, and when they came to Muhammad وسلم, to teach the Quran, he taught them in their own dialect. So if someone couldn't say ah in the middle of the word, like al-mu'minun, the Prophet وسلم, would teach them say al-mu'minun. If someone couldn't say as-sama, we don't speak like this in Egypt, we say as-sama, we don't say as-sama, As-Sama. And this is in Qira'at Khalaf and Hamza. As-Sama. So the Qira'a was taught to people or different tribes based on the dialects they spoke to make it easy for them. And the meaning is always the same. The meaning is always the same. Only the tashkil or some of the dots are slightly different in these different Qira'a, but the meaning is always the same. And the easiest way to explain this to someone when you read, for example, you see, this is the example I give all the time. You see the word water, W-A-T-E-R. If in the Qira'a, for example, in the American Qira'a, I'm just going to use an example from English to make it easy for everyone. The American Qira'a would be water. The British Qira'a would be water. Then the Egyptian Qira'a would be water. Like, the word is the same, but the pronunciation, the style, the style is always different, but at the end of the day, it is water, the water we drink. 
It is not different. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the best in this life and the best in the life to come and give us sincerity in everything we say and do.